Great victories call for great celebrations. Great victories call for great celebrations, right? You've never uh, watched a major sporting event, whether it be a Super Bowl or if you're watching the Olympics or the World Series or, or whatever sporting event you like and whatever the, the top like game of that would be. You've never seen somebody win and be like, ah, oh, no big deal. Right, I was watching the Olympics yesterday and watching the USA men's basketball team uh, play France for the gold medal, and, and the U.S. won, and it was really dramatic and close, and, and none of those players were like, eh, no big deal. In fact, it was really intense because they were playing in France, and they were playing against the French team, and uh, there was moments where it looked like France was going to come back and win, but, but man, all the U.S. You know, basketball players, some of them who've won championships, and that's just kind of what they do, were still excited to win the gold, because it was a big deal. It's every four years, it was on this like worldwide stage, right? right. Whether it be uh, something outside of sports, if you've been, been praying that God would come through and, and deliver and, and heal, and he does, like the proper response isn't just be like, eh, no big deal, right? Or if you are in school and you were really struggling with grades and you worked your way through and there was this grind and this fight and you got that C to a B and that B to an A, it wasn't just like, eh, no big deal, Right? It was something worthy of celebration. Like when, when Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples weren't just like, eh, no big deal. Like they celebrated, they rejoiced. They, some of them were like, I don't even, I, I know he said he would do it, but it, it blew my mind. And, and Jesus had to reveal himself to his disciples. And then it started this movement that you and I are now a part of called the church. Again, big victories call for big celebrations. Psalm 18 is no exception to this. Psalm 18 is actually a celebration psalm for David or from David to God for the great victory God gave him over all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. If you look actually uh, in most of our Bibles, it's kind of like the heading. It's, it's actually one of the longest headings of, uh, of the Psalms in the entire book. And it says this, a Psalm of David, or it says to the choir master, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. This is King David. And he's, as he's positioning himself before God, doesn't tell us that he's King David. He tells us that he's a servant of the Lord who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul, he said. And then it goes on to that beautiful poetic description of just how mighty and powerful and epic and awesome God is. And how when he delivers, he delivers big. And so that's what we see and are caught up in in Psalm chapter 18. But these words are written to the Lord from David, and, and God is receiving these. David is writing these words on behalf of the fact that all of his enemies in the hand of Saul, he was delivered from. And notice it's interesting that, that David kind of has two categories here. He says, all of my enemies, and then the hand of Saul. In case you don't know what's going on here, Saul would have been considered one of David's enemies. Saul wanted David's head on a stick. He wanted him dead. And yet David is still having grace and mercy, even in writing the Psalm towards Saul. And so this is the context. This is the victory. This is like a long time coming that, that God promised that David would get the throne. And yet over 20 plus years, we see a lot of turmoil, a lot of heartache. That's what we see pinned in some of these other Psalms leading up to this. There's a lot of stuff going on. And yet right here in this moment, we see that God is faithful. God is come through on his promise and he's delivered this great victory. And again, David isn't just sitting back and being like, eh, no big deal. David is so full of joy. David is so full of gladness and excitement that he, he begins to speak these words. And so that's what we find ourselves caught up in this morning. If you take away nothing else from this morning, take away this. God is worthy of praise because he is mighty to save. God is worthy of praise because he is mighty to save. To save. Now, I want us to make sure that as we read Psalm chapter 18, that we remember that this was written like from David to God, but that we also realize that, that it's all about Jesus at the same time. There, there's a lot of things pointing to Jesus in this Psalm that we, we cannot miss. And the same God of Psalm 18 is the same God here today and the same God that has saved us from our sins, the same God who is put on skin and his name is Jesus. And so don't distance yourself too much from what's going on here. Because we have been given a great victory and that is worthy of great celebration as well. To read Psalm 18 is actually giving us language, giving us a context, giving us words to be able to speak praises to God for his faithfulness in our lives today. 
So would you adopt this for your own life? There's five things we're going to work through as we unpack these 50 verses. The first one is this. God is the rock who hears the cries of his people. God is the rock who hears the cries of his people. Let's look at verse one. I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love that David starts off just, I love you, O Lord. And then he goes on to say, my strength, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock. He doubles down on that rock imagery in whom I take refuge, my strength, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Right here, we see nine unique names that that David gives in praising God. And these weren't just random names that David pulled out of a hat and just decided to put in this psalm. They were experiential names, names that David knew firsthand when it seemed like everything was crashing in around him. David knew from experience that this God whom I praise is my rock. He's my shield. He's my deliverer because I've seen him deliver me from the hands of the evil ones. I want you to pay attention though that that David isn't just saying that God is the rock or the fortress or somebody else's deliverer or a God, he's making it personal. My strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my shield, my horn, my stronghold. It's personal for David. Let me ask you this question. Is it personal for you? Like when you talk to God, you talk to him Like he is this personal, like he's this close, like he's this intimate, like he showed up and showed off this kind of way in not just David's life, not just somebody's life, but in your life. And would this just be an encouragement to our prayer lives to address God personally? Like there's a tension we have to ride as Christians where like God is holy and he's other than, and he's above, he sits high and he looks low, but he's close and unique and tender and personal. And he wants to get to know you and he wants you to get to know him intimately. And there's a good tension to ride there. Like you should feel the weight of that and lean into it. David goes on to say, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Notice he called and was saved. He called out upon the Lord. He called to him and he notes that this is the God who is worthy of my praise and I am saved from my enemies. Then we go into verses four and five, and David goes into great length and detail here to describe the kind of like pain and sorrow and turmoil that he was going through. One of the things I want us to see in the book of Psalms is like the the tension, again, of God being highly lifted up in praise, but also pain being put out for us to see clearly. And so David doesn't shy away from saying that God is all these awesome things. And in the next words to talk about just how bad it really was. And he's being very poetic in how he's describing it, but, but he's being real and he's being honest and he's being raw about how it felt to be in his scenario, in his situation. The cords of death encompassed me. I want you to think of that imagery. The torrents of destruction assailed me. These, these ropes and these waves crashing in. The cords of Sheol entangled me. That's the cords of hell entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. David is saying death was looking me in the face and mocking me. This is what David, the one who's saying, that, but my God is the rock and the deliverer. This is the same David who says, man, it was, it was seriously intense. It was hard. There was moments. It felt like I was being strangled. It felt like I was drowning. It felt like nothing was going to change. It felt like death was looking at me, staring me, and mocking me. David descri- describes this with intensity. And can we just be honest? Like if, if any of us have been punched in the mouth by life at all, we know that this is what it feels like sometimes. And it's not just unique to those outside of the faith. In fact, in the faith, God promises us that you will have, you will have suffering. And so in some ways, signing up to follow Jesus is signing up to suffer and to take on some things that are actually more difficult than it would be if we didn't follow him. And many of us who have, who've said yes to following Jesus and who've been faithful to follow him have actually experienced more suffering as a result of that. And so again, we're, we're in good company to know that the guy who wrote this, the King David, the man after God's own heart, in, it describes pain and suffering in a very real and vivid way. And so, man, here's the hope and encouragement for you. If you find yourself in a place this morning where this feels real to you, like the God who saves him is just as real. And would you, would you use this language to pray to God and say, no, it feels sometimes, God, like death is coming at me. It feels like 
death is staring me in the face. It feels like the cords of hell are wrapped around me. But the good news is, is David doesn't stay here. He moves beyond this because God is bigger than this. But I don't want us to make light of what's going on. And I never want to make light of what you're going through in this life. Like the hurt and the heartache, the difficulty, the doubt, the fear, the anxiety, whatever it is you are going through, whatever it is that's like staring you in the face, like it's very real. But would you, would you choose to believe that God is more real than even those things in your life? In my distress, I called upon the Lord, verse six. To my God, I cried for help. And from his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. I love that it's in his distress that he cries out. Sometimes I think we buy this lie that, man, I just got to get it all figured out or I just got to get my life in order or and I just got to wait till I get through all the chaos and heartache and then I'll cry out to God. It's the biggest lie on the planet. That's actually what the devil is trying to sell you to believe. Devil, the devil's fine with you believing that. Yeah, yeah, just, just wait till you get it all figured out because the devil makes sure you never get it figured out. But David shows us something beautiful here in what faith looks like in my distress. Are you feeling distressed today? Are you feeling chaotic today? Are you feeling like, man, I, I know I love Jesus and I know he loves me, but it just feels cha- crazy and chaotic a little bit in my heart and mind. Cry out. Don't wait till the, the waves calm. Talk to the one who can calm the waves. Like, would you cry out to him right now in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the crazy and watch him respond? Because that's what it tells us here. That from his temple, he heard my voice. He heard my cry to him and it reached his ears. God heard David. David's cries reached God's ears. God is the rock upon which we stand. And he is faithful to hear your cries. Would that be an encouragement to you this morning? Let me, let me ask you this. If, if God is faithful to hear your cries, when's the last time you cried out to him? And maybe some of us can pinpoint, yeah, I know, because it was a really dark time. Why does it have to be so dark for you to cry out? I mean, would you cry out when it's boring and mundane? Would you cry out on the top of the mountain because you, you know that you wouldn't be on that mountain if God didn't put you there in the first place? And would we be a people who cry out to God the moment we wake up? We don't even wait for our feet to hit the floor before we cry out to God and say, God, I need you this morning. Your mercies are new. Can, can I have some, please? Would we be a people who cry out because the Lord is our rock and he hears us? Point number two, God rescues his people like a mighty warrior. From verse seven to verse 19, we see this incredible display of like, okay, you, you poked the bear and he woke up. So, so God is hearing the cries of David and God in his hearing of the cries of David doesn't just sit back and say, again, no big deal or David, you can handle it, brother. Like I'm gonna sit back and, and chill. No, God responds and his response is insane. It's amazing, it's beautiful and I don't want you to miss it. So let's look at it again. What we just read in verse six is that the, the cries of David got to the ear of God and God heard and God is now responding. It says, then the earth reeled and rocked The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked. Why? Because he was angry. Here's one thing the Bible does. It tells us very clearly what God hates and what he loves, what makes him angry. But this right here tells us those things that he makes clear about what make him angry. This is what happens when he gets angry. The earth rocks and reels. The foundations of the mountains tremble and quake because God is angry. And this should tell us something about the the nature and the glory of God that when he gets angry, the mountains start to shake. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. Like you read this and if if you didn't understand what was going on here, you would think you're reading Lord of the Rings and smog is waking up. Like you you would think this is a dragon responding, right? No, this is the God of the universe. This is the one who has saved us and redeemed us, the one who spun the stars into motion, the one who is holding you in the palm of his hands, the one who said you could breathe and you just took your next breath. This is him responding to the cry of David. And this is symbolizing his wrath towards the enemies of David. One of the things that the Psalms and other places in scripture make very clear that when God delivers and redeems, it usually looks like, justice and wrath being poured out on the enemy. 
And, and so David, we see, is, is delivered and he's like set free. But the result of his deliverance and freedom is like the, the wrath and the justice being poured out on those who were persecuting David. I want us to see too that, that God has every right to be angry because David is God's chosen one. And the enemies of David continue to come after him. And we've said this before, like if, if God is on our team, if we're on his team, maybe a better way to put it, if we are on God's team and someone is going up against us, they are opposing God. And so, so again, for, for the enemies of David to oppose David is the equivalent of the enemies of David to oppose God. That is what's happening here. And so God being angry is a good, holy, right response. Verse nine, he bowed the heavens and came down. Like that just gives you a, an, an insight, a, a vision of like how heavy God is, how weighty he is. Like the heavens bowed down and he came down. A thick darkness was under his feet and he rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. Notice that God is not delayed, but he's quick in his deliverance. Now this is interesting because if you, you know anything about the narrative, if you don't, that's okay. Like there, there's about a 20 plus year gap between when God said, David, you're my dude, to the moment where David is delivered from his enemies. And you have to believe, right? Like that at points, David at like year 10 is like, this doesn't seem very swift to me. This doesn't seem very quick to me, Lord. We even see it in other Psalms. He's like, how long? Like, do you even hear what I'm saying, God? Like it, this is rough. Like, like there's Psalm chapter three says, I have thousands of enemies, God. Do you not notice it? They're actually blaspheming you. Are you, gonna, are you gonna do anything about this? And so there's moments that it doesn't seem like God is being very swift. And yet right here, it describes God's response to David as swift. And who's telling us this? David. The encouragement for you and me should, should be this, that in sometimes in the moments of the pain and suffering, it doesn't, it doesn't always feel like God is answering or delivering, at least the way we want but right here in the moment where David sees it full circle, hindsight is always 2020, right? David has the vision, the clarity to see, no, no, God was swift. God rode in and in ways that I couldn't see. I was too, too small and too ignorant to see. But now I see because God is gracious to give me the eyes. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds, dark with water. And out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And God sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils." Again, take note at how mighty God is. The breath of his nostrils expose the foundations of the world. Like, just might be kind of weird, but go, like, it didn't do anything. God does that, the, the foundations of the world show themselves. The channels of the sea reveal where they are. This is the kind of power and might that our God has. He flashed forth lightning Channels of the sea were seen. Foundations of the world were lay bared. Heavens are bowing down. Clouds are turning dark. Lightning is flashing. The channels of the sea lay bare. And so did the foundations of the earth. This is what happens when God steps in. This is David describing when God steps on the scene, when God enters into the ring, when God says, okay, I, I'm going to cover my man, David. This is what goes down. Again, it's not a good idea to be an en enemy of God. Because this is how he responds. Verse 16, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. Don't miss verse 17. It's a, a boast at how big God is and how small David is. God rescued me from my strong enemy. So if my enemy is strong and my God rescued me, that's like the common sense equation or, or like determination should be that, that God is bigger than and stronger than my strong enemies. For they were too mighty for me. They were too mighty for me, David says, but they're not too mighty for my God. And maybe, maybe that's like the position you need to take this morning. Like your enemies are too big for you. You're not as, as great as you think you are, but God is greater than you think he is. And he's greater than anything that stands in your way. 
Verse 18, they confronted me in the day for my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. God rescues. And when God rescues, he does so like a mighty warrior. I love that God doesn't just snap his finger here and and then everything is fine. Now that God goes through great lengths and great detail and shows himself to be so massive and mighty that David is left saying, oh my goodness, this mighty warrior. All the enemies know that God is big and mighty and that when he rescues, he doesn't do it halfway. Notice the progression of what's happening here. He took me, he drew me out, he rescued me, he brought me out. And then David says again, he rescued me because he delighted in me. David takes great comfort, great hope in knowing that, man, the, the reason God delivered me, the reason God saved me is because he, he loves me. He cares about me. Again, it's, it's very personal for God too. It's, it's not just personal for David. David gives us insight to say, no, God, when he shows up and rescues David, it's not because David, like, it's not because God is bored. <laughs> it's because David matters. David is delightful in the eyes of God. This leads into point number three, God rewards the righteous. Verses 20 through 30, we see David giving this kind of principle laying down of, or first off, he talks about his own righteousness and how God has been kind to him because of his own righteousness. But then he goes on to describe again, this idea that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Verse 20, the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands. He rewarded me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rulers were before me, or excuse me, for all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. So so like, let's just pause there for a minute. Like David was serious about the word of God. And David was serious about knowing it well enough that he could obey it. And this is what he was able to go before the face of God and say, I'm righteous, God. This this is audacious, guys. Like, Like David's like, no, God, I'm good. I'm clean. Like, I'm righteous because I've kept your word. I know your word and I've kept your word. His statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him. I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands in his sight. Now, for those of us who know the story of David at all are thinking, hmm, that seems odd. David, I'll just put it this way, did some very shady things. Like you may have done some shady things, your shadiness and David's shadiness, not on the same level. And yet here God is, or David is crying out to God saying, God, like I, I'm righteous and I've kept, I've kept your word. One commentator said this, this was not a claim of sinless perfection on David's part. In fact, the year or so before the death of King Saul was spent in some significant measure of spiritual and moral compromise. Yet through it all, David kept a core of integrity towards God. He was correctable despite of his failings and most importantly, did not fail in the greatest test. And here's the greatest test to not give in to the temptation to gain the throne through killing or undermining Saul. So this this is what he's boasting in. He's saying, look, I, I had plenty of opportunities that it seemed like that I could have ended Saul's life and I could have taken the throne, but God promised me the throne and he said he was going to give it to me and I'm not going to cut corners because if my God said he's going to do it, I'm going to trust him, not me. I'm not going to let temptation lead me into a place where I compromise my faith in the Lord. And even again, like we, we look at what, what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah, like when, when he, you know, had an affair and when he like killed the, the woman's husband on the battlefield, like what we see happen there is David is exposed and he repents. That's Psalm 51. We'll get there. But after he is exposed and he genuinely repents, we don't find David wandering off and doing the same thing again. He genuinely repents. He, he learns his lesson. His heart is broken. He is made clean and he continues to walk the path that God calls for him. And I'm not saying he was never tempted to do that again, but the, the Bible doesn't give us record of him going back and doing that again with another woman. And again, that, that's happening after this, this account But we have to see that that what David is boasting in here is actually not even his own righteousness, although he says it. It's the righteousness that is a gift from God that has been given to him. And we, we see that actually later on. Verse 25 tells us that the merciful you show yourself, to the merciful you show yourself merciful. And with the blameless man you show yourself blameless. With the purified you show yourself pure. 
and with the crooked you make yourself seem torturous. For you have you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. So again, David is reminding us this is how God rolls, that man, if you are merciful, he'll show you mercy. If you're blameless, he will show himself blameless. If you are pure, he will show himself pure. And if you are a crook, he will make himself look torturous to you. In verse 27, you save a humble people, but a haughty, but the haughty eyes you bring down. So here's my question for us. Are we a humble or are we a haughty people? There's only two options. Are you humble or haughty? Now, haughty is a, a fancy way of saying proud. The idea of haughty is, is like sitting high and looking low and, and like mocking and making fun of the fact that people aren't on your level. Oh, them down there. How cute. Like that, that's the idea of being haughty or, uh, oh, the, the peasants down there. Like that's the mentality of being haughty. And so we're either humble or we're haughty. What are we? And if we're humble, we admit that we're needy and weak and lowly and poor. And if we're haughty, we're proud, arrogant, selfish, and thinking less of other people. And there's only two options. And here's the reality. If you see God clearly, if you see him rightly, if you see him the way he really is, there's only really one response, and that's humility. Like I'm always going back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, if you don't know it, go and read it. We, we see that Isaiah sees God on the throne, high and lifted up. And Isaiah describes the train of the robe filling the temple. Smoke fills, it shakes. And what does Isaiah say? That I'm the man. God, look at how dope I am. Look at how cool I am. Look at how awesome I am. God, bless me. I'm amazing. Is that what Isaiah says? No. Isaiah says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And, And God, like, have mercy on me. He doesn't boast in himself. He he gets a glimpse of God and he's like, who am I? Oh my God, you're amazing. Like, flatten me. That's Isaiah's response. And God has grace and mercy on Isaiah, cleans him up and then says, go be my missionary. That's how that story continues to go on. But we're either humble or haughty. Where do we find ourselves this morning? And, And here's the truth. Like if you are proud, if you're haughty this morning, would you let the spirit of God break you today? In fact, I would implore you, would you humble yourself? Would you humble yourself before the Lord and realize that he is God and you are not? That his ways are higher and better than yours. And that if you submit yourself to him, if you humble yourself before him, if you lower yourself, he's promised that he will show grace and mercy towards you and he will lift you up. But if you go against him, if you oppose him, he will bring you down. Would you choose to humble yourself this morning? David continues on, for it is you who light my lamp. For the Lord, my God, lightens my darkness. So not only is David being rescued from man, all of the stuff that's been happening over the past 20 plus years where enemies are just chasing him down and Saul is wanting him dead. So, so God is now given David the throne. He is now the king. And so, so now what? Well, David tells us now what? That he, is the, he has lit my lamp and the Lord, my God, lightens my darkness. So the future is bright for King David because the light of God is leading the way. David goes on to say in verse 29, for for by you, I can run against a troop and by my God, I can leap over a wall. You you gotta think about what's going on here. And and in Psalm 18, David is describing, this is what God has been doing in delivering me. And there's been a need for this deliverance for 20 plus years. If you've been running from your enemies for 20 plus years, and then you go to battle and war and you win, are you not exhausted? Like you've gotta be exhausted. You've got to be worn out. You've got to be like, God, can I have a water break, please? And yet David's response is, no, he, he's going to help me to leap over walls. He's going to help me go up against a troop. In other words, when God delivers, he gives us supernatural strength to move forward. And many of us have experienced this firsthand. Like, man, man your sin and your depravity and your bondage, and it was heavy and it weighed you down and, and the Lord delivered you and you got this supernatural energy and strength because those things that were burning you were gone and the spirit of God filled you and you're able to move and to run and to go further and longer and better than you ever were because this is what the Lord does. He gives us supernatural strength. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. The word of the Lord proves true. God told David, you're my guy. You're going to be my king. 
And David had an option to, to take that promise and to hold fast to it and believe it. And on the days that seemed the darkest to, to believe it or to doubt it, and he chose to believe it. And even when the temptation to doubt and the temptation to fear like rose up, he was honest about it, went to the Lord and said, God, you are faithful. I have no reason to doubt you. You've been faithful then, you'll be faithful today and you'll be faithful forever. And so he reminds us here that the word of the Lord proves true. Can I remind you that the word of the Lord proves true today? So would you trust it? Would you lean on it? Would you take hold of it? Would you hide it in your heart that you might not sin against him? And many of the doubts and the fears and the things that go on inside of our heads and our hearts really boil down to a lack of delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on it day and night. Like Psalm chapter one wasn't joking. Like we will be planted by streams of living water and we will bear fruit in its due season. This leads us to point number four. God equips his people with strength to walk in victory. Again, we saw that there in Verse 29, I can run with a troop. I can leap over a wall, but watch what happens when, when God's strength comes upon David and equips him to walk in victory. Verse 31, for who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Now, now David is writing this, this beautiful poetic like question to, to get our, our hearts and our minds like stirring and turning, but let's just answer the question. Who is God but the Lord? Nobody. Like that, that should be the resounding answer in our heads and our hearts. Who is a rock except our God? No one or no thing. So with this reign true in our hearts, there is no one like our God. Like this is as, as followers of Jesus, man, we stand firm on this and it might be offensive to the world and that's fine. There is no other God like ours. Jesus is not just another guy. He's not just another prophet. Christianity is not just another religion. It stands supreme. It rules and reigns over all. Man, man, the enemy is a footstool to King Jesus. Like all those other religious leaders, Jesus props his feet on their heads. There is no one like him. Verse 32, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. He has made my feet like the feet of a deer and he set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and of your right hand, you have supported me and your gentleness has made me great. Isn't that amazing? That David says, no, my greatness comes from God's gentleness. Would that be true of us? You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. God gives supernatural strength that goes beyond our limits and our shortcomings. And do, you, do you feel like you're at your, the end of your rope? Do you feel weak? That's a great place to be because it's going to force you to look up, not look to yourself. And God promises David that he's going to give him the strength to overcome his enemies. He says he's given David enough strength to bend a bow of bronze. Bronze could not be bent in David's own strength. Like, I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how awesome you are. I don't care how much CrossFit you're doing, how much weight you're lifting. It doesn't matter how jacked you are. You cannot bend a bow of bronze on your own strength. Maybe Chad could. That's about the only person. But David says here, I'm able to bend a bow of bronze because God has given me the power to do so. The salvation of God covers David completely. And then what happens Verse 37, I pursued my enemies and overtook them. This is David talking. This is David flexing on God's power and he's taunting and mocking his enemies at the same time. He said, I pursued my enemies and I overtook them and they did not turn their back until they were consumed. Or I did not turn back until they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet for you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. Think about that. Those who were coming, the, the torrents and the waves and the ropes that he was talking about earlier in verses five and six, right now are underneath his feet. You made my enemies turn their backs to me and those who hated me, I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. Even David's enemies, listen to this, they cried to the Lord, but the Lord did not answer them. That's intense. So, so there comes a point where, where David is like overcoming them and he's overpowering them and the enemies realize, oh, this isn't David. This is the Lord. They cry out to the Lord and it says right here that he does not answer them because they have already committed 
treason against the king. David says, I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. So God leads David to a total and complete victory. And I'm I'm here to encourage you this morning that when God leads you to a victory, it's not 75%, it's not halfway, it's total and complete. And you and I find ourselves in a unique position in the already and not yet. We talk about this a lot. This is why we titled the series Praises for Exiles because we are in exile. God has come in the form of Christ. He has conquered death. He has risen. Jesus has ascended and he's seated high on the throne. And yet he's coming back a second time. And we're in between those two times. And so victory is ours and the fullness of that is still yet to come. So don't be twisted in thinking that it's not done yet or that God has given up on his efforts or that God doesn't hear us or that, man, the victory God God can't really pull through. No, it's just not in your timing. And I promise you his timing is better. David pursued and overtook and consumed his enemies. Did you hear it? Those who hated David were destroyed. There was no hope for those who opposed David. God does not do halfway victories for his people. Be delighted and encouraged by that fact. Point number five, God establishes his eternal kingdom that is complete in Jesus Christ. Again, we've talked about it, but I want want to make sure that as we, we land this psalm, that we don't miss how it completely points to Jesus Christ. Verse 43, you delivered me from strife within the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. So God establishes David as the rightful king, the rightful king of Israel. But notice that it's his extent and of his kingdom is not just limited to Israel. Did you hear what it said? that he was the head of the nations, that people who did not know David began to serve David. As soon as they heard of who David was and and the way in which God delivered him from his enemies, they just started obeying David. Oh, oh, that David? Okay, yep, whatever he wants. Whatever he says, I'll, I'll do it. And as soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. And this image is like these people were up against God and up against David. And then when they heard about God's deliverance of David, they're like, "Uh uh-uh, this fortress ain't big enough. Like these castle walls, they're they're a little weak compared to that kind of strength. And they, they come out trembling. Nations obeyed and submitted. Foreigners fell at his feet. And again, this should give you an imagery of the rule and reign of Christ. This is about David but it is about Jesus and what happens when he shows up as king. Verse 46, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be the God of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. He's he's going back and reminding us of all the things that have happened so far in this Psalm who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. And for this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. On one level, this was David praising God for his deliverance and safety among his neighboring kingdoms. And on a second level, this is important if you're taking notes, Paul actually quotes this in Romans chapter 15. And this is the first of four Old Testament prophecies demonstrating that the work of Jesus Christ was not only for the Jewish people, but it's also for the Gentiles as well. So again, Paul said and realized and recognized that that Psalm 18 isn't just about David and his kingdom. It's about the kingdom of Christ Jesus. Verse 50, great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and listen, and his offspring, how long? Forever. David was confident that he was God's chosen king because he trusted in God's promise and didn't take matters into his own hands. This is a a great testimony to the faithfulness of David. And we know that that David didn't have a chance at faith unless God gave it to him. And God has been faithful to David for over 20 plus years that he promised David the throne until he actually sat on it. But never once did God go back on his word. Never once did did God tell David, hey, nope, sorry, I messed up. Let me get some white out. No, he made a promise and he kept it. And he tells us that through the line of David would come the greater king, and that is King 
Jesus. One of the, the titles that we give Jesus is the son of David. And that's to remind us of this reality that, that all throughout like God's story, he's promising us a Messiah, one who would come and save and redeem. And so he tells us when he establishes David as king, hey, I'm going to have someone from your lineage, from your bloodline sitting on the throne forever. And so, so it's not just that David is just going to get another king and then there's going to be another king and there's going to be another king. No, someday God is going to send the king and he's going to sit on that throne and he's never, ever, ever getting off of it. And his name is King Jesus. And this is who Psalm 18 is pointing to. And we love him. He is our rock. Jesus is our strength. He's our fortress, our deliverer. He's our God. He's our shield. He's the horn of our salvation. And he is our stronghold. And when we called on him, Jesus, who is worthy of our praise, he saved us from our enemies. And if you today do not know Jesus and you call upon him who is worthy to be praised, he will save you from your enemies. Who are your enemies? Your flesh, sin, Satan, and death. The cords of death surrounded us and hell's grip was tight. If you had life, if you now have life in Christ, you remember what that was like. If you don't have life in Christ, that is where you find yourself today, that the cords of death are surrounding you and hell's grip is tight on you. But for those of us in Christ, God heard our cries for help and sent King Jesus who strapped up like a mighty warrior and came to the earth. And the way he did that was so brilliant because he did it in the form of a baby. Like God's plan to go to war is to send an infant or send a little baby in the belly of a virgin. And that, that baby was born and he lived 33 years growing and maturing and developing and living a sinless, perfect life, showing us this is what humanity was meant to experience in the first place. And all the while, he's reminding the devil of what's coming his way. He's rebuking evil spirits. He's casting out demons. He's telling storms to stop storming. He's healing, raising the dead, and he's given blind their sight back. And he's preaching the good news of the kingdom. And he's saying, I'm the king. Would you bow to me? The word became flesh and Jesus lived the perfect life that we were called to live and yet we could not. And this Jesus, he submitted to the will of his father and died a sinner's death that we should have died. And yet with his final breath, his battle cry rang from the heights of the heavens all the way to the deepest parts of hell. And it was this, it is finished. Again, God is waging war and getting victory all over the place. And on that cross, we see it most clearly. When his blood had drained out and his hands and feet are spread wide and he's exposed for the world to see his last dying breath, it is finished. He was sent to earth to save us. And he took us and he drew us out of the many waters and he rescued us from the strong enemy with an even stronger arm. And his resurrection from the dead proves the clarity of his victory. If you, if you want to know if, if Jesus is winning, if you want to know if, if the victory is ours, look at the empty tomb. Death has been defanged and the devil has been defeated. And he has placed his righteousness within us so that we can stand confidently in his work on our behalf. We have righteousness too. It's just not our own. It was given to us and it was bought with a great price. But you and I in Christ stand righteous and redeemed, pure and holy. So we stand in confidence and yet great humility. We come to him with that deep humility, and he meets us with amazing grace. And Jesus, he is the light to our path. And let me tell you, church, our future is bright. Our future is bright. It's not just bright in the next coming days and months and years for all of eternity. Our future is bright. His way is perfect. His words are true and can be trusted. And he is our shield in whom we take refuge. And there is no one like King Jesus. He equips us with supernatural strength to move forward his mission and overcome all of our enemies and the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. This is what I, I love about our salvation. God doesn't just save us from some stuff. He saves us into some things. And you and I have been saved into new life. We've been saved into supernatural living, meaning that the spirit of God lives in us so we can go and make disciples. We can go love those who are ridiculously hard to love. We can tell demons to shut up and sit down and go back to hell where they belong. We can go and meet those who are on the fringes that no one loves, no one cares about, and come to them and to give them drink and be the hands and feet of Jesus in real time. This is what supernatural mission looks like.
and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Jesus is alive and he is our rock. Church, bless his name. Would we lift it high today? He has brought us great salvation. David's offspring is still occupying the throne and he will for all eternity. Zeal Church, God is worthy of praise because he is mighty to save. And great victories call for great celebrations and let today be one as well. May we celebrate the victory that we walk in because our King Jesus is our rock and our redeemer.